This serene, slow-moving, and strange-looking animal is a manatee. And this handsome fellow is its close relative, the dugong. They're air-breathing herbivores, the only aquatic mammals that exclusively eat plants. And both of them are endangered species. Dugongs cling to survival in a few isolated corners of the globe. And with only a few thousand Florida manatees remaining in the wild, the clock is ticking in efforts to save these amazing creatures from extinction. In central Florida, a diverse group of biologists and wildlife officials capture manatees for health exams, census counts, and genetic testing. But safely securing a wild animal that can weigh more than a ton can be a challenge. With some recent conservation success and a baby boom of sorts, manatees are being considered for delisting from the Endangered Species Act. But would the controversial move be far too premature? Like many iconic species, manatees and dugongs have unlikely advocates, eco-tourists, many of them children. Manatees and dugongs' closest relatives are elephants. With thick, leathery hides and coarse hair, they are essentially aquatic pachyderms with matching appetites. Their spindle-shaped bodies slim down to enormous tails. The main difference between the two species are that dugongs' tails are fluke-shaped like a whale or dolphin, and manatees are round and paddle-shaped. They are indeed some of nature's more eccentric creations. These are Florida manatees, a distinct subspecies of the West Indian manatee. They are intensely curious, don't move very fast, and, for better or for worse, habituated to the presence of people. You can't go far in the Crystal River region of Central Florida without seeing a reference to manatees. They're even featured on license plates. But even though manatees are iconic animals, they're gravely threatened by a decades-long boom in wetland development and dramatic increases in human population. Each year, hundreds of manatees are killed in U.S. waters, mostly from boat strikes. Disease and cold weather also take a toll. 2006 was the worst year on record for manatee deaths. At least 416 perished. But things are looking up for manatees. The past few years has seen a baby boom. New births have helped to offset high mortality rates. We really want to have a balance, and we certainly want to have more calves born every year than animals are killed each year. And as long as we have that positive growth, then we're going to see the rewards associated with that in the population overall over time. It's when you get more manatees killed in one year where you have births that you present a problem. 
Today, biologist Dr. Bob Bondi is leading a massive effort to capture, examine, and release wild manatees. Animal health assessments are initiatives to help protect endangered manatees. And you need a lot of people to haul a 2,000-pound wild animal from the water. Representatives from local, state, and federal agencies are all on hand to help and to learn. So we're going to basically go over some of the ground rules. We have a lot of people here. We have a lot of activity that's going to be going on. Hopefully, we're going to have a lot of manatees. So why are we doing this? Why do we torment manatees and catch them? Well, this is a research project. The USGS is instructed to come in and learn as much as we can about the health of the manatees in the Crystal River National Wildlife Refuge. Fish and Wildlife Service mandates this, so it's good for recovery purposes to know how well manatees are doing. Manatees' preferred winter habitat is central Florida, and a lot of people live here, and many have boats. In Florida, when it gets cold, uh, manatees look for warm water sites, and so uh, the warmer the water, the better for these tropical manatees that are found in Florida and southeastern United States, the northern limit of their range. With all these people moving down into Florida and bringing their boats, there's a greater, greater burden on the manatees that use the same waterways the boats do. And so it's only a matter of time before a manatee gets scarred. It's not just the swirling propeller that causes the problems. In fact, only in 40% of the implicated deaths that are associated with watercraft mortality. In the other 60%, it's impact trauma. So you actually have boats that are going so fast through the water that they just come in and hit and, uh, and cause damage to manatees that's often lethal. In nearby Crystal River Wildlife Refuge, the team prepares their equipment and clears the beach of rocks and debris. We're going to be uh, supplying medical support and health support for the animals that are brought up, which means we'll be looking at their respiratory rates, we'll be looking at their heart rates, we'll be taking blood samples, we'll be checking areas of the blood that'll help us determine whether that animal is not getting enough oxygen. For those participants who've never experienced a manatee capture, it's a thrilling introduction to one of Florida's most revered species. We're looking for single animals so we don't set on too many. And, uh, and so the manatee goes into the net as it's swimming out. And you can see the footprint in the water right here as it goes into the middle of the net. that boat, deploy the net in a horseshoe around the manatee and then basically draw the manatee to shore. The net has a lead line and a float line. The lead line um, kind of digs up the bottom and the float line stays on top and we bag the animal up before it pulls to shore. Hull design is a malt skiff design um, that the old malt fishermen of Florida used to use and we've modified it to our own needs by uh, having a removable transom and we took out a bulkhead. So now we're able to totally uh, set a net all the way around a manatee. Once the net is set, all hands are needed on the beach to wrangle the animal to shore. Stop with the floats. We'll bring the floats this way now. Open it up. You're OK. Just let that stay down. OK, step back with the float. Open it up a little bit. Yeah, that's fine. That's good. Slow down on the float. Float a little bit. Float, float, bag it. Let's, floats only, floats only. Bag it, bag it. That corner right there, bag it. Right bag? Yep. Spin the head towards the beach. The head's going up, ready? Head side pulling. Tail is pulling. One, two, three. Ready, ready, ready. Push this up a little more. Are you ready? Yep. One, two, three. Beautiful. It is a team effort because we're manhandling an elephant-sized animal. It takes a lot of people to pick up an elephant and tote it around. Now, an elephant, you can train to walk over here and plop down and, and take your blood sample. A manatee's taken out of the water. It's got to be carried. So it takes a bunch of us. The tail, just a little weight on the That's it. Right the your hands on the animal, though. Okay, we're going to roll the animal to its on its right side. 
we're going to tuck the net and tuck the stretcher, okay? All right, everybody ready? We're going right onto the foam. One, two, three. Good. Hands on the animal. That's right, all yours. Thanks. <laughs> good job. Once again, good job. The first animal caught had distinct scarring from a boat strike. What are you doing there, Bob? Um, well, we're just documenting the scar pattern. So you can see that the uh, skeg mark is on the bottom half of this animal. And the propeller, as it swirled, ended up hitting the back and caused this really distinct scar. So what this enables us to do is keep um, okay, which, an identity uh, we'll for this individual so we can follow it over time and we'll be able to monitor um, its survival from one year to the next. The first manatee capture was a success and a valuable learning experience. But it took too long. The team will have to speed up the process. It's a huge task to organize so many people and resources. It takes time, and they have just two days to complete their work. The animals are generally not happy to be captured in nets and hauled on shore, and some protest a little more strongly than others. Floats in, floats in, bag it, bag it, bag it. Most of the manatees put up quite a struggle, and light as a feather, they're not. They're heavy, and they, they get bigger. These, these guys have been in um, kind of the bigger range, but they can definitely tip the scales even, even heavier. We rescued one back in March of uh, 2007 in Daytona Beach. It was 2,700 pounds, and that was a, a large animal to catch. That's why you can see out here today, uh, it takes a lot of people, a lot of coordinated efforts to get these guys safely caught on shore, worked up, and then back in the water. One, two, three. This big male has never been captured and is unknown to the team. I'm not sure he's in the catalog, so this will be a new cataloged animal. There's just mild scarring on his back. He has remnants of barnacle scars on his body, which, is, which means he's been out in the salt water good portion of the, uh, the season. So this may be a transient male that's moving through the area, which is unique and genetically will be very interesting for us to look at. Right now we're just keeping an eye on the tail area. It's probably the most dangerous part of the animal. They have a lot of strength in their paddle. And uh, so if the animal starts to roll or something, we want to make sure we can get weight on it really quickly. OK, now we're going to feed this underneath the neck okay. and out in front of the head. We're going to look at blood values, and we're going to see how healthy the animal is. We're going to look at the immunology. We want to know what the stress levels are in the animals. So we want to try to make a composite picture of what's happened to this animal in the more recent history, but even over the long term. It's one giant puzzle with a bunch of different pieces that's going to put together the status and health and welfare of these animals that are out there. I forgot to tell you, first thing you always want to do is scan the animal. A challenge facing Andy Garrett and the rest of the team is to positively identify each manatee and find out if the animal was previously captured. One of the key tools in their arsenal is a tiny electronic ID device called a pit tag. Sticking. We uh, insert microchips in case we ever catch the animal again. We know we've had it handled it before. In case it comes in rescued um, or dead, we know where we've handled it before. The manatees are first checked for existing pit tags. If none are found, the animal is prepared for a minor surgical procedure to insert the device. Guys, he's a head driver, so just be ready already. Sticking. The microchip itself is no larger than a grain of rice and is implanted with a modified syringe. Pit tag is then registered in a database. Zero 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 six nine six C two eight E eight E. Yes. Got it. Yeah. How's he doing? On shore, the manatees instinctively hold their breath, but under stress, their CO2 levels can rise dangerously high. The animals are induced to breathe by simply dousing them with water. We want to encourage them to take breaths 
and we want to give him oxygen. So we literally have an oxygen valve that we put right in front of his nose and as he inhales, he's, he takes up some of that oxygen and it helps to keep that CO2 and oxygen balance pretty even. Blood work is perhaps the most valuable part of the health exam. Like humans, manatee blood analysis reveals vital information about the animal's well-being. Core samples are sent out to various labs for testing and cataloging. But with a new high-tech device, much of the work can be done on site. We call it an iStat machine. It measures blood gas, and what that means is we can get a blood sample from the animal and it gives us the pH and it tells us their CO2 level, their oxygen level. It also tells us their lactate. It just literally takes a few drops. A small tissue sample is cut from the tail for DNA analysis. In this Crystal River greater population, we've collected over 700 cookie samples from manatees. So we have a really good representation genetically of the stock population. Two, three. A necessary and unenviable task is to collect urine and fecal samples. You can tell a lot about a manatee from what comes out of a manatee. What we've got here is a fecal sample from the first male manatee that just got brought up on the shore. And um, my professor at UF uses these to look for hormone concentrations and sex steroids in the uh, manatees. You can tell a lot from a fecal sample, apparently. <laughs> Right now we're doing the measurements, uh, straight line, curvilinear, total length, and then we'll do some girths. 252 for straight line, and then ISCA, curvilinear. Nearly all of the manatees captured and examined were exceptionally healthy. But one of the last animals to be caught appeared to have suffered serious trauma. It did not struggle in the nets at all. It was either injured, weak, or very sick. A boat strike likely caused severe scarring and internal injuries. Fresh, deep wounds were not a good sign. The team must now decide whether to evacuate the animal to a medical facility or to release it. So we want to get his weight, we want to see if this injury is serious enough to have caused debilitation. And then we probably want to sample a couple of these little lesions on the body. Well, this manatee was actually uh, hit by a boat very recently. And, and in this area right here, we were actually noticing that there was uh, some swelling. Hey, Dan, what oral temperature? And we're concerned that there might be some deep tissue swelling and also some bone involvement. So by putting an ultrasound probe on here, we're able to very quickly um, assess that there actually is deep tissue swelling here and possibly some bone involvement on the edge. Um, nothing that's so drastic that we might want to think that he immediately needs to go into rehabilitation, but it's something that we would want to monitor um, out in the wild over time. One of the last orders of business in the manatee health exams was to weigh the animals. One, two, three, oh! Clear. Call it, someone back there, call it. 16, 10, 15, 25. 16, 25. Coming down. After two days of intense work, the last of the manatees was examined and released. It was a very successful endeavor, and the team learned a great deal about Crystal River's wild manatee population. But why do we do this? You know, why do we care that manatees are around? And I think it is real important. I think that I've been blessed with the opportunity to learn from manatees and to get out there in my research career to do this. I would love to pass it on to other researchers, but I'd also like to pass it on to my kids and their generation. One, two, three. One, two. You know, when I started 30 years ago, we were just writing the books about manatee biology. And though we've written some really interesting works, we've learned a lot about manatees. But there's new things right on the horizon. You know, these animals don't cease to amaze me. 
Some rescued manatees are too severely injured to be released back into the wild. But how do you care for a really big aquatic animal with an even bigger appetite? If a manatee survives a boat strike or is incapacitated by disease or cold stress, Florida has a number of facilities which care for sick or injured animals. Homosassa Springs Wildlife State Park is one of a handful of centers in Florida that rehabilitates manatees and provides some of them with permanent homes. In captivity, the animals need intensive care and a lot of food. Homosassa Springs Wildlife State Park is sort of an animal sanctuary. What we have are injured animals, animals that have nowhere else to go, and animals that have actually been confiscated in some cases. The manatees that are here, they probably couldn't survive on their own. Volunteers and park staff get into the water each day with resident manatees. Okay. A mostly sedentary lifestyle and a rich diet has helped to push the manatees' weights a bit towards the hefty side. These guys being captive animals, uh, most of them have been captive animals, are brought in for rehab for a number of years, so they're not going through that annual migratory amount of effort they have to put in. They're also not going through the just having to look for your food on a daily basis. Of course, in the wild, they're not going to be eating a lot of sweet potatoes, but we need something that's a little bit of bribery, basically, to get them in and make sure we can get a good look at them every morning. No eating rope. No rope. Uh, this is Amanda, actually. Amanda's one of the injury cases that came in. Um, as you can see here, she's got some really deep prop cuts. And those actually go all the way down along her side. Now, Amanda got caught in a lock system and she got locked in with a boat as they drained the water down. She was basically pinned up against the boat, bounced off of it, and into the side of the propeller. And this is Rosie. This is actually the largest animal. And you can see the scar on her head. That's the reason she's here. She took a direct strike across the top of her head. Last year, of course, was a real bad year for boat strikes. Um, the propellers actually cause a lot of damage. The boat strikes themselves cause a lot of the deaths. Uh, all this tissue up here is lung. So when manatees are hit by a boat, you're cutting into the lungs. A chest full of water on a person, a manatee, any kind of mammal, it's a drowning. Here at Homosassa, we've got only female manatees. Uh, just because we don't allow captive breeding. Actually, captive breeding is not allowed anywhere. And the reason is female manatees spend several years raising their calves, teaching them pretty much where to go to get food, where to go to get water temperature, and also where to go to get fresh water. And that's not something we can teach them here. Manatee's closest land relative or closest genetic relative is the elephant. You do see some similarities. They do have that prehensile upper lip, which is basically just a shrunken down, modified version of an elephant's trunk. They also have the same toenails that elephants have. So you got those rounded off. Not much good for digging or, or clawing, but they do have toenails on there. Uh, and they also nurse their young in the same place, which would be in the armpit area or the, the flipper pit area on a manatee. So there are quite a few similarities between the two. At the park, rescued animals have many friends. They're personable, they're gentle, they can be demanding. <laughs> it's a very cool volunteer position. I've lived here full time for three years now, and I've been at the park for about two years. So it's a really great, I never even heard of manatees till I got here. I know there's one there. <laughs> now they're about my favorite critter. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Cindy. I'm a volunteer here with the Florida Park Service. I'm expected 
The manatees at Homosasa Springs are very popular tourist attractions. And as long as the food keeps coming, the animals are happy to oblige appreciative audiences. Observatory at Homosasa provides a remarkable glimpse into the underwater realm of a Florida spring. And here the manatees get their main meals for the day. These guys will get romaine, they'll get kale, they'll get cabbage. Uh, iceberg lettuce is basically green water, so we don't feed that. The romaine for them is probably one of the higher proteins. They'll get peppers, they'll get, depending on the day, kale, bok choy. Bananas actually are one of their favorites, and they'll also get about 50 pounds of carrots a day. Keeping the park's manatees healthy and well fed is a never ending chore. Our manatees here at the park eat a lot of food four times a day, so this is pretty much an all day event every single day of the year. So, a lot of the research as far as manatee diets and what they're their dietary needs are comes from research with actually elephants, being that elephants have been captive a lot longer than manatees actually, so they know a lot more about the nutritional needs of elephants. Manatees, even though they're called sea cows, internally they're basically horses, so they're similar to another animal that we know a lot more about. In the wild, active manatees eat even more food. They can ingest hundreds of pounds of vegetation daily, up to 10% of their body weight. They do offer us a service. We're out there with these same boats that run them over. We like to keep the waterways clean. Manatees feed on the plants. They're grazers, and they're doing us a public service by keeping waterways clear. The big thing with manatees, they're the only marine herbivore. So if you take an animal that's doing something like that, which is removing plants from an ecosystem on a natural basis. If you take those completely out of the equation, what you're going to get is massive overgrowth of lots of plants and choked off rivers and waterways. And we really don't know exactly what the impact of the amount of plant life they take out of the ecosystem is. If they were gone completely, we might never know how well they manage this ecosystem. For a more hands-on approach to manatee ecotourism, you can snorkel with the animals in the wild. They crave attention and a good belly scratch. It's the middle of winter, it's cold, and it's way too early. But still, hundreds of bleary-eyed tourists, many of them children, descend on Crystal River and other waterways where manatees live. They come to see and interact with manatees in their natural habitat. Okay, take three more over here, guys. The best time is the morning time to see the manatees. That's when we get the best interaction out of the manatees. Um, Later in the afternoon, they start feeding. They could care less about us, so we want to get out there early. Let's go over a couple of rules that we went over yesterday, just to make sure we're all on the same page. We want to be as quiet as possible, right? That is the most important thing. It's cold out there this morning, so the manatees should be plentiful. They like to be scratched on their belly underneath their flippers. Stay completely on the surface. The manatees have to come to us. If we go diving down and there's a manatee on the bottom, he's either sleeping or feeding. We don't want to mess with him. Typical weekend. Lots of people, lots of kids. Gets a little crowded, yes. Is it a good thing, is it a bad thing? That's a debate that could go forever. In my opinion, it's a good thing. It's getting education to our youth, and that's what we need to do. Um, it's just going to go a long ways in protecting the species. There's more awareness. 
And the awareness is taking place in this younger generation. And these are the people that are going to be responsible for taking good care of not only us when we get older, but the manatees that are out there. So it's very encouraging that young people get interested in this stuff. This water environment that we have around us is almost as alien as another planet. And it shouldn't be. We've got animals the size of elephants 10 feet away from us wandering along the shore. We don't see them because they're under the water. So I think anybody that gets in the water, swims with manatees, sees them in that natural environment, comes out a better person for that experience. The manatees are almost like cows and dogs crossed together underwater. And then like when you try and pet them, they'll roll over like a dog so you can scratch their belly. When you pet them, they're really rough and they don't feel all that great. They feel like yeah. Like yeah. Climbing, like, yeah. Yeah. They they like, have that like algae layer. Yeah, like on shells the and algae yeah. and like slimy, scaly. It's nasty. Rough. Like the calves make these really high pitched and squeals. noises. Yeah. Squeals. And it's kind of like. Yeah. Ee, ee, ee. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a giant kindergarten class got mad in the pool. It was a lot of fun. It's just an incredible feeling when you're in the water with 212 year olds. Manatees swim over and they roll over in their belly. The kids rub their belly just like a big pet dog, eh? And they're, you can hear the kids giggling underwater. It's, it's a great experience. Every school should bring kids down to something like this. Did everybody have a good time? Yeah! Lots of manatees? Oh yeah. How many would you say you saw? Ecotourism of this sort could be a very powerful source of conservation. Most of the visitors who come to this refuge are children. And children are exposed to the tri-dimensional world of a manatee, and they do see how manatees behave and move underwater, and they gain a more a better appreciation. Sometimes they use the word love, that they end up loving these animals. Ivan Vicente is just one of a handful of wildlife officials charged with protecting manatees. Some in the conservation community feel that manatee tourism, especially the widely condoned practice of touching the animals, has gone a bit too far. That's why we try to encourage passive observation so that when people are in the water, they try to establish some distance so that they can view from a distance and have more quality experience when swimming with a manatee. We just want to get away from a petting zoo concept or a park. It's a wildlife refuge and manatees should be treated as the wild creatures they are by people allowing them to have the right of way and letting them do what they want to do. An aerial tour is a good way to find manatees and to see some of the impacts of an ever-increasing human population. <laughs> hey, good morning. Good morning. How are we doing? I'm doing great. Good. How about you guys? Good. We're going to go find some manatees today. Open. Tour boats go about their daily business near the manatee sanctuaries where the animals are protected. But from the air, the amount of nearby shoreline development is staggering. And right in the midst of the canal lots, boats, and enormous homes are hundreds of manatees. Human population has grown very rapidly. It's a very desirable place to come down and live in Florida and to bring your boats and to live right on the water. Those kinds of uh, burdens on the society of having 1,000 people a day moving in and living and occupying Florida habitat is putting a greater drain on the habitat that's out there in the environment. And this is the same habitat and environment that's, that is utilized by manatees. With our growing population in Florida, more and more people, greater demands on the freshwater resources, we've tapped water out of the aquifer. So it's flow reductions at even Crystal River and all of the other natural artesian springs that we've been monitoring is down significantly from historical periods. And in fact, it's even projected that in the next 10 and 20 years, reduction of some of these springs may fall 10, 15 percent. And that's a substantial amount less of warm water coming out that manatees will have available. Nearby Homosassa River and its springs have seen even more dramatic losses in water volume over the past few years. We were once a six million gallon an hour spring, now we're a two million gallon an hour spring. And what you have is just 
water being used uh, for agriculture, for golf courses, and uh, for housing. So it's taking water directly out of the source. We don't have enough warm water here for manatees, and Mother Nature designed them to live around the equator in the tropics. Um, then Florida and the southeastern United States is not becoming a very suitable place to have manatees. On the other side of the globe, dugongs face similar challenges in their struggle to survive. And just like Florida, some of their staunchest advocates are children. a world away from the freshwater springs and rivers of central Florida is the United Arab Emirates. This Middle Eastern country is a study in contrasts. Stark desert terrain, explosive urban growth, and the rich marine ecosystem of the Arabian Gulf. And this is one of the places where dugongs live. Dugongs are found along the coastlines of over 35 countries. The two largest populations are centered off Western Australia and the Arabian Gulf. Unlike manatees, dugongs spend their entire lives in salt water. There are more dugongs than manatees in the world, but they are spread out over a much larger geographic area. They are still considered an endangered species. And like manatees, dugongs face daunting challenges in their struggle for survival, especially pressures from a growing human population. The growth in the last 30 years has been tremendous. The population of uh, United Arab Emirates as a whole in 1968 was about less than 200,000. Today we are talking about 5 million people. Most of them are living along the coastal belt. This. Uh, creates a tremendous uh, challenge for us. We have a number of very important habitats and very important species, some of which have uh, global importance, uh, like the dugongs and the sea turtles. It is our duty, it's an international duty for us to protect these dugongs. Dugongs are frequently struck and killed by speeding boats. But the animals live in the open ocean and do not have to navigate congested waterways like manatees do. Boats are not their greatest threat. The most serious obstacle they face is the development and dredging of their coastline habitat. This is where lush beds of seagrass are found. Just like their North American cousins, dugongs need a lot of food. Because seagrasses are generally very low in nutritional value, they have to eat constantly, and dugongs roam over vast areas of the ocean floor in search of food. In traditional wooden dows, dugongs were historically hunted for their succulent meat. But since the 1960s, they've been a protected species. Fishermen used to use handheld harpoons to capture and kill the animals. The government of the United Arab Emirates has since drafted comprehensive and far-sighted legislation in regards to marine conservation and dugongs continue to be one of their top priorities. All right, children, what is this animal called? Dugong. What is it called? Dugong. It is the most important animal because there are very few left. Marine protected areas and strong awareness campaigns are helping to protect dugongs. Children are also introduced to the marine environment by scientists who visit local schools.
students are also encouraged to participate in hands-on field trips. We have more than 120,000 students we work with in different schools, and we have different programs, and we have also uh, educational program for marine environment. Learn more about the biodiversity and learn more about the ecosystem they live in. But still, we have more to do. We will know that if we've been effective or not when they grow up and start living within this ecosystem. Awareness campaigns in the United Arab Emirates appear to be working. After decades of sharp decline, the dugongs of Abu Dhabi are showing encouraging signs of recovery. Getting the message out to new generations has proven to be a key tool in marine conservation. Back in central Florida, manatee numbers seem to have stabilized and are perhaps even growing. But is it far too early to remove them from the Endangered Species Act? Florida manatees have no natural enemies and are believed to live up to 60 years or more. Current estimates indicate a stable but small population of perhaps 4,000 animals. They are still very much at risk. Manatees mature and reproduce slowly. They generally give birth to a single calf only once every three years. And with few offspring to replace animals killed, the population doesn't recover easily. Sanctuaries and restricted manatee zones have been created throughout Florida, and warning signs are posted in waterways frequented by both the mammals and by boat traffic. Aggressive public relations work and media attention is getting the message out, and snorkeling with manatees is helping to foster a new generation of passionate advocates for manatee conservation. I had someone once come up to me and say, you know, I wasn't here for dinosaurs. Why do my kids have to see manatees? And I think, you know, it's really kind of sad we didn't see dinosaurs. They'd be magnificent animals to work with and to study and to see on this planet. Likewise, we can do very little on our part and still have manatees around, but it means making a sacrifice. So the big question is, are you willing to make a sacrifice for something in your environment? And a lot of people will say no, but I think it's against our human nature not to try. Stabilizing the manatee population and increasing their numbers is a goal shared by many in Florida. And the animals are doing relatively well. Like the bald eagle and other species which were removed from the Endangered Species Act, manatees are being considered for delisting. But there is close to unanimous opposition to the controversial move. Is it far too early to remove them from the act? The state agencies essentially realized that there were probably more manatees in Florida than we've had, and so the prognosis was that you'd had a pretty good developing, growing population. The feds have followed suit with that kind of rationale and logic as well, and made recommendations. And generally, the models you have are the best assumption of what's happened to a population in the past and predicting what's going to happen in the future. And that's fine if everything stays status quo and nothing changes. But we know every day it's a ticking bomb with manatees, that things are changing that are unprecedented, have not happened to manatees before. If you look in the near future, manatees have done pretty well. Is that a reason to take them off the list? Right now, they're afforded the protection of an endangered species. They also have a lot of sanctuaries set aside for them because they're an endangered species. Delisting them would, for one, make those sanctuaries possible areas to be developed. And that would take away more habitat for them and potentially cause a lot of problems for the animals that are recovering. There are some pretty large lobbying groups in Florida that want to see them changed from endangered to threatened on the listing status. And they have their own agendas and their own reasons for that. But in our particular case, we're definitely not looking for that to happen and hoping that it doesn't. You have lobbying industry that one extreme say, 
I want to go fast in my boat, I have that right, you shouldn't be imposing any restrictions on me. And then the other group says, well, we shouldn't even have boats out there in the first place. Let's restore it back to the way it was before people came on the planet. And both are extreme, so what you have to do is kind of meet in the middle. Manatees are luckily still on the endangered species list. For now, manatees and dugongs are holding their own, but they continue to face many challenges.